Hello, welcome to episode 154 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, A Thousand One Movies You Must See Before You Die. This is a big one, literally. I've been um, kind of avoiding this film for quite a while, even in the early days of doing this challenge. I looked to this film as one that I was not looking forward to uh, sitting through because of its mammoth length. Um, it's seven hours and for some reason I felt like I needed to watch it in one go and so I've been avoiding it and avoiding it and about three years ago I started watching uh, the first part of it. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would but I thought you know what I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna pick up the blu-ray so I did that I picked up the Kino blu-ray um, about a year ago I think when it was on uh, sale on Amazon and finally yesterday as part of my silent movie marathon 4 which you'll be seeing at some point in the future um, I checked out the Vampires from 1915 and 1916, directed by Louis Fouillade. Uh, it is a, cr a crime thriller, serial, epic, um, uh, I, I, and again, I, I hasten to say movie because it isn't quite a movie, it's a series of movies. It's television before there was television, it's a film serial, and again, if you already know what film serial is, you'll have to forgive me for a second as I sum it up. But back in the days of pre-television, the way to tell a story uh, episodically through the medium of film was to do a serial where they would show an episode every week of the cinema, every month, whatever interval they'd set up, uh, infrequent sometimes, frequent in other cases, and you'd see an episode before the, uh, the main feature. And in the case of The Vampires, it doesn't actually... Uh, bring over the convention of cliffhanger endings either, which I thought that it would. It doesn't really do that. It kind of has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the promise of the story continuing, but it doesn't end on a, what will happen to our heroes, which you see in, I guess, more of the serials of the 30s and 40s, and I'm sure it must have been done in the 1910s and 20s as well. Um, and this is a French serial, uh, again, by director Louis Fouillade, who um, was very prolific um, in the silent era, uh, made hundreds and hundreds of films. He was once asked for an interview and said that he doesn't have a minute to spare, so he was a workaholic, made hundreds of films, and this was but one of those projects, and it is considered his one of his masterpieces. Um, so there was a lot of expectation going into this film, slash series, slash collection of films, series of films, I don't know what to call them because it's in the book, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die, but it isn't quite a movie. But I thought I would tackle it like a movie and watched it in one go. So I watched the entire seven hour whack in, in one sitting. Um, not from start to finish, I, I did it over about a 12 hour period. So in one wake cycle I watched the entirety of The Vampires. Uh, which would be, what, Le Vampire, I guess. And it doesn't actually focus on vampires. It's not literal vampires. The story takes place in Paris uh, at the same time this was made, 1915. And it's about a, a crime ring of uh, this gang called the Vampires. And we have a reporter called um, Philippe Guron, who is uh, investigating the vampires, and very publicly so. Uh, and so he quickly becomes uh, the principal target of the vampires. They're trying to get this guy, Philippe, this reporter who's sticking his nose where it shouldn't be stuck. Uh, and the vampires, I mean, they're, they're running roughshod over Paris. They're, they're killing people. There's decapitations. They're, they're stealing money. They're doing all sorts of stuff. And you really get the sense that they're just, they're just doing it for the fun of it almost. You know, I mean, there's all this money that gets stolen, but you just see them kind of frolicking in their, their secret hideaways and stuff. And they just enjoy killing. And it gets quite dark, but there is um, a light tone to the film, which definitely comes into play with uh, Philippe's sidekick in the, in the film. I'll just call it a film from now on to just to make it more simple, Mazamet. Now, Mazamet is definitely the comedy relief, the comic relief in the film. Uh, he is this almost bumbling sidekick, but really he gets more done than Philippe. And towards the end of the film, in the last few episodes, he really almost becomes the, the, the primary hero because he's the one who's always figured out what the criminals are up to. And then he t tells Philippe, oh, I know, I know where the vamp, but there's at least two or three moments where they're like, what do we do now? And Mazamet is like, oh, I know where the vampires are. I've got this other information you don't know about Philippe. Um, but the thing with Philippe is that, uh, not Philippe, uh, Mazamet, uh, the, the sidekick character, is he, he mugs at the camera. Um, you know, he'll be, you know, talking in the scene and then, you know, like, or he doesn't point, but he almost points. Like, it feels like he's about to start pointing and going, hey, hello. Like, it, it really um, uh, pulls you, you're out of the uh, the story a little bit. 
and I, I became used to it over the, the seven hour period and just realized that that was his character's thing. And I would imagine at the time it would be very um, fun for the audience um, to, to be engrossed in this, this crime thriller and then to kind of be let down every now and again by, by someone kind of you know, goofing off. And I, I do imagine people laughing at it. There's a, an episode where he brings his young son, well he doesn't bring his young son into the story. His young son is brought back to him because he's been causing trouble in the school that he's been sent off to and, and the son likewise will look at the camera and start laughing and almost like audience participation and it feels a little theatre-esque whereas the other characters don't look at the camera. Some of them do sometimes, every now and again, you'll, you'll catch them looking at the camera and it feels intentional, it doesn't feel like a mistake, but um, it's more of a, just a glance, you know, just a little, hmm, this is interesting. Whereas Mazamet is very much broad and, you know, again, almost points at the camera and going, yeah, yeah, hello. So that was distracting, um, but again, towards the end, I didn't, didn't mind it so much. Philippe uh, Guron is... A pretty bland one-dimensional character. Uh, it's not spoiling things to say his fiance gets killed in the second episode by the vampires in a very elaborate, um, well not even an, an attempt on her life, an, an actual uh, murder and a successful attempt and he doesn't, there's no fallout from it. We never see him upset over the death of his fiance. He just go, goes on business as usual. He's got a new fiance towards the end. Um, so a lot of times the, the gravitas doesn't really become a part of it and it feels very um pulp fictiony you know uh just serialized kind of just crime pulp you know just serialized stories um that there's not too much uh, emotional weight to them but there are dark elements um you know decapitations that there's a, a head that gets found in a box and there's a couple of brutal murders or at least the the way that we hear about the murders or the way that we see part of the murder is quite brutal uh, obviously you're not seeing anything extreme, but the implications are quite extreme. Uh, and then you have these these moments of comic relief from Mazamet. Um, but the, the key to this film, I think, that makes it so enjoyable to me is the lead villain, Irma Vep. Uh, which, of course, is an anagram for vampire, and you see that in a very cool kind of stop-motion sequence of someone rearranging the, the letters in their mind, a very cool sequence. Um, and Irma Vep is played by um, a woman who went by the name of Musidora. Her real name was uh, Jean Rock, I believe. And Musudora is incredible as Irma Vep. I mean, she's on the cover of the, uh, the Blu-ray, rightfully so. I mean, just iconic uh, uh, image of her uh, is, is online everywhere. And it's this image where she looks quite ugly and ghastly and uh, garish. But um, actually, there are moments where she, she really has quite a beauty to her, which I found quite um, enchanting and intriguing. And I found her so utterly watchable, um, even when she was being evil. She was like Darth Vader. Uh, she was an evil character who did evil things. You, you couldn't get behind their morals, but you really enjoy watching them on screen, more so sometimes than the, the hero characters. Uh, and she's not even the lead, uh, you know, the, the head of the, the vampires. She's more of the, the female ringleader. There is the Grand Vampire, the Grand Inquisitor. There's, there's quite a few kind of head characters. And in fact, the Grand Vampire changes because a couple of them get killed throughout the course of the 10 episode um, story. And that's when I found that I got a little bit disinterested when there was multiple Grand Vampires coming into it. I just preferred the one who was in it for like the first half. And the there's also another character who comes into it who's part of a rival gang of criminals called Moreno. And the Moreno storyline um, spans kind of the middle of this film and it kind of takes the focus away from Philip almost entirely to the point where it's about the two evil gangs trying to outdo each other. And it's literally just like the bad guys versus the bad guys and the good guys are just over in the corner. So it does feel uneven at times. There's convolution everywhere. If you watch it in one go as a seven hour film, it does drag, but I can't hold that against it because it was not intended to be watched in one go. It's just the way I chose to do it, I suppose, and I wouldn't do it again. Um, but I really loved it. I really, really had such a good time with this. And not just because of Irma Vep, who was a great character and played so charismatically by um, Musidora, who also was an acrobat, and so she did some of her own, well, she did all of her own stunts in the film. There's a great scene where she's in a, in a car and she escapes and kind of climbs out of the window and, and goes around the side onto the back while it's, you know, going down the road and uh, she jumps off, you know, just little cool scenes like that. There's some cool action in the film. But what I really loved was the crime aspect, the thriller aspect, and you can see the influences of this film 
in so many films that went you know onward uh, beyond this film uh, and, I, and I wouldn't say that someone like David Fincher has probably even seen this or has been influenced by it but um, purely by other people being influenced by this and then it, it going on in that chain of osmosis of of ideas I feel like it probably it, there's something to be said for this film being a seminal moment in the the thriller movie uh, and the crime movie the gangster movie even if you look at the vampires as, as gangsters um, and all the little elements that you know were around in fiction and, and novels and things like that but to be put on the screen like this and realize in such a fun way from codes you know there's a scene where Philippe is uh, unraveling a code book and it's just really like fascinating and interesting to see him do it there's invisible ink that gets revealed and then disappears there are these uh all these little tricks and things and these sliding doorways trap doors and um uh, poisoned pens and all this just all these little details that they put in where anytime you see the vampires going after someone to kill them or to capture them or to steal their money it's always in a different way and it's always interesting like there's an episode where um this American comes into Paris and he's this millionaire and the vampires have this elaborate plot to like misle him out of a couple of hundred thousand francs and it's literally like 10, 15, maybe in well probably about 10, 15 minutes of you just seeing the vampires working their magic to to swindle this guy out of this money and it's just fascinating to watch that like the lengths that they go to there's all these disguises uh, the first grand vampire is a master of disguise. He has like five, six, seven alter egos that you see throughout the film. And that is also something that really reminds me of Fritz Lang's 1922 crime thriller epic, Dr. Mabusa the Gambler. Uh, there's so much of this in Dr. Mabusa the Gambler. Very different film. Uh, Fritz Lang put a lot more of a, an artistic flair into that film. And the story is quite different, obviously. But master of disguise, you know, um, this underground crime ring. Uh, there's so many elements that, that really, uh, I feel, definitely influence uh, directors like Fritz Lang, Alfred Hitchcock even, um, you know, so, so this is a very important film, I think, and it's it's really surprising how watchable it was to me. Um, and if I just look at the, the back of the Blu-ray, the first, and go through the episodes, uh, episode one, The Severed Head, kind of speaks for itself. We have a kind of um, very early, ah, what's in the box, kind of moment uh, in this. Uh, episode two, The Deadly Ring. Uh, number three, The Red Cryptogram, which is the sequence I was talking about with the, the code book where he's kind of, he's uh, crossing off letters in, in random sequence and, and decoding a message. It sounds really bland, but it's, it's really just fascinating to watch. Episode four, The Spectre. There's this guy who apparently gets bumped off and then he appears again and it's like, what is going on? Great little mystery in that episode. Uh, episode five, The Corpses Escape. Uh, someone who, who apparently is dead gets up again and all sorts of stuff uh, ensues from there. Episode six, The Eyes That Mesmerize. Uh, the character of Moreno um, can hypnotize people. Another key plot element that was used in Dr. Mabusa. Uh, number uh, episode seven, uh, Satanas, uh, the new grand vampire, comes into the story. Episode eight, the Lord of Thunder, a mystery uh, surrounding um, uh, the grand vampire using a cannon to blow up buildings and stuff, and they need to find out where the cannon uh, is coming from. Episode nine, the Poison Man, who is the third grand vampire, who is a master of kind of a chemistry and, and poisons. And episode 10, The Bloody Wedding, which is the finale. And I like that there's a finale and there's a, a definite conclusion to the story because it does meander, it does get a bit convoluted. There are characters that get introduced that don't feel too integral to the plot and are spent too much time on. But again, this is serialized storytelling and from what I understand, this definitely wasn't a day one, okay, here's the 10 episodes, here's what's going to happen in every one. Very much kind of improvising as they went. One of the key ways that The Vampires tells its story is through text. Uh, now, obviously, with silent films, you have intertitles where you'll see kind of the quotation marks and uh, pieces of dialogue that the characters are saying to each other or just uh, descriptions setting up the scene. And you get that, both of those things in The Vampires, but you also get the, the story told through notes where characters will give each other notes, or they'll be reading newspaper articles that have information from the plot contained in them. And what I liked about The Vampires was that um, it, it's littered with these things, but uh, it changes it up uh, suitably, you know, every, every next time you see one of these notes. It's either, you know, different handwriting, you know, a different piece of paper, or it's a telegram, so I really liked the way that these um, the, these printed notes, these kind of uh, exposition sheets, if you will, uh, were done differently. Sometimes it would be even a map that's been drawn. So I liked how the story was told through these close-ups on 
notes and things like that. Uh, I'm glad that it has English subtitles because some of the cursive writing I wouldn't even be able to understand if it was English. So I'm very appreciative of the subtitles um, on this Blu-ray. So I thought that was a really effective way to keep the storytelling going and um, mixing it up between the intertitles of dialogue and setup. The style of, of shooting in this is very um, basic, um, but it's deceivingly basic. A lot of it is just static shots of a room with characters talking. Um, and so, it again, quite static, but at the same time, when you get into the more action-oriented scenes, it's deceptively um, well shot. You know, moving cameras, um, things like that. Nothing too elaborate, but it just it serves the story, and it never really felt like it was... Because, um, I mean, you look at stills of the film, and it just looks a little bit boring. But once you're watching it, I don't know, it was just really watchable to me and the, the very static style didn't mean, it matter too much to me. And apparently it was criticised at the time for not employing you know, interesting filmmaking techniques, but sometimes you don't need to go crazy with the camera. Uh, a great quote from someone, I don't know who it is, said that, uh, you know, service the story first. Don't be doing you know, clever shit with the camera just for the sake of it. The story first. And you could argue the story isn't perfect in this film, but I don't feel like it was... Um, you know, boring because there was nothing crazy going on with the cameras, all these great techniques. There's a couple of cool techniques like stop motion photography, there's a, a nice split screen moment in one of the episodes. What I really liked was the lighting, uh, and it's also a detriment at times too. Uh, they would tint the, the, the film uh, to blue at night, uh, for nighttime scenes, which they did a lot back then, uh, and it kind of looks silly when you can clearly tell they've shot something in the middle of the day. Like you can see people on the bridge down on the river just walking back and forth, probably going out for lunch somewhere, and it's supposed to be midnight, and it kind of uh, it drags it down a little bit when it's clearly shot in the middle of the day, and it's meant to be night, and they've just tinted the frame blue. Um, but there are great scenes where it's indoors and it's blue, and the the character will, will flip a switch. And it's really well done, and there's some really nice moments of lighting that really add a great mood to some of the scenes in the film. And a lot of the scenes are quite light-hearted, but some of them have a really cool atmosphere to them. And so for me, the vampires, there's always something different going on, you know, and I mean there's scenes where there's characters jumping onto the top of a moving train, and, and there's these great chase sequences, and they never go fully overboard and like over the top and like, you know, massive you know, extravagant set piece. There's just these little great moments peppered throughout the entire seven hour run of all 10 episodes. And again, if you look at the sheer mass of footage, you know, seven hours plus in this film, uh, a lot of it is filmed very routinely, but there are these flashes in there of really great filmmaking. There's one scene in particular where Philippe's new fiance is lying in bed and she's nervous and she's ready for someone to try and make an attempt on her life. She has a gun with her, we can see that she has it underneath the quilt, and when she sees that someone from the vampires are outside her window, they're trying to get in, she pretends to be asleep. And the tension that gets built in that scene, the, the, the editing, the shot choice, uh, is so well done. That is one of the best scenes in the entire film, when one of the, the gang members is kind of slowly cutting out the pane of glass in the window. It's just a really well put together scene. The music too, that was composed for this release, is really, really good. It really fits, and obviously again, with seven hours, it does get slightly repetitive, but not to the point where it's a detriment, which I think is really impressive. I didn't like how they put um, sound effects into the soundtrack though, so when and someone's ringing your door, you hear the bell or the buzzer, and I really didn't like that. That kind of threw me out of those moments, so I wish they hadn't done that. Otherwise, the score was very good. Um, so overall, I, I loved it. Uh, is it a film you should see before you die? Absolutely yes. And, and I probably should say at this point that um, when I'm saying is it a film you should see before you die, I'm assuming that it's someone who is into films to the degree that I am. I mean, if you're watching this video this far at this point, then clearly you have an interest in classic films or, or want to get more into them. And so for you, absolutely, it's a film you should see before you die. Obviously, my, my friend who only goes to see the blockbusters like Marvel movies, no way in hell he's going to watch it and wouldn't get anything out of it if he did. So, yeah, it's a film you should see before you die, but it needs to be taken into account sometimes that that's for people who are interested in films and film history and things like that. But it really, really held up. Like, it was surprisingly watchable. At no point in the whole seven hours did I feel bored. I just felt like, you know, oh, there's quite a bit left and there could be other things I could be doing, but I'm still enjoying it. 
you know, uh, I really thought I'd start nodding off. I thought that I would start getting really just lethargic and, uh, and you know, having to kind of wake myself up. No, none of that. It was really, really watchable, but I wouldn't recommend watching it in one go. I would say the best way to watch The Vampires is probably to take a week and, and probably check out like two episodes a day. They're quite uneven in terms of length. They vary from 15 minutes to an hour long. Um, but to keep up with the story and all the things going on, I would, I would kind of recommend watching a couple of episodes at a time, probably over about a week, something like that, to really get the most out of it. And there are the, there again, there's, there's bits that kind of, you know, the, the story that, that start and then they don't lead anywhere. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not perfect. But for, for you know, how old it is, I, I just think that it really was one of the first footsteps in a genre that has become um, so great in film, which is the, the crime thriller. And while it does kind of throw off some of that serious stuff with the goofy humor, especially with the character of Mazamet, um, I, I still think it's it's quite it's quite uh, it's quite something. And and again, Philippe Guerin, the main character, really, there's nothing to him. But I kind of like that. I kind of like this one-dimensional vessel of a of a do-gooder, you know, uh, just to service the story, to get us to the good stuff with the vampires and Irma Vep, who just an iconic performance in this film. I, I loved her character and her story uh, and just seeing where she ended up and just yeah that that's the main reason to watch for me is to come back again to see Irma Vep. Um, just a yeah, great character and uh, a great performance by her. Just really without even doing much she just effortlessly commands the screen without really seemingly uh, trying to I think. There's just she has that aura about her. She went on to be quite uh, successful after this and uh, also moved into producing and directing films as well in the 20s so she's uh, one of the examples of the uh, the early women in, in cinema history who really um, started uh, producing films and not just being the star or the eye candy but actually proactively um, becoming filmmakers themselves which is always really cool and I could probably talk about this film even longer but um, I'll leave it there um, again towards the middle around episode 6-7 started to drag a little bit but it's not really meant to be watched as a whole so I can kind of you know let that one slide and as I say looking at the camera kind of takes you out, out of it a little bit and some of the the lighting well not even lighting but just the fact that it's shot in the middle of the day and it's been tinted blue doesn't fool anyone doesn't look that good you know uh, it's, it's a shame they couldn't have just filmed it at night and, and put up a light somewhere so we could get some kind of atmospheric stuff going on but uh, it is what it is and some of the action like obviously they've used dolls, you know, in some of these these scenes where people are flying out of buildings and stuff. But there's this fantastic scene where Irma Vep uh, is escaping from this very tall building and she's wrapped herself up in this in this rope around her stomach like 30 times. She hooks it onto the top of the the building and then she just spins down. And I mean, I, you can tell it's a dummy, but it's such a badass like exit from like a from a building, like the the perfect escape. <laughs> and uh, and she just pulls it off. Just again. She is the main reason to watch this film, I think, and uh, I'll leave it at that. If you've seen the film, or films, uh, let me know what you think of them down below. If you haven't, I highly recommend you check it out. I highly recommend the Blu-ray. Uh, it doesn't look as clean and crisp as some of the recent you know, 4K restorations of silent films, but the, the, the scratches and the damage on the print kind of give it a character that I quite enjoy. So for me, uh, the Blu-ray gets top, top marks, no special features. But, you know, obviously you're getting a seven-hour film. Uh, it, it's really worth it. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.